want to invite you to bow with me as I pray the 19th Psalm. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So with some encouragement, um, I've taken on Halloween today. And um, it's no easy task, actually, because Halloween is a big part of pop culture. Uh, Faith in pop culture uh, series continues. And as we're looking at, at the Halloween holiday, it's not, it, it's not your ordinary candy fest, but it certainly is that. And so we shamelessly buy into that and, um, and, and have fun with it. There are some churches that are offended by Halloween and, and work not to uh, recognize it and work for alternative uh, activities for kids other than Halloween. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, where that comes from. The passage from Deuteronomy, um, I'm getting a little ring feedback up here. Is you getting any feedback back there? The passage that was read from Deuteronomy um, is, a, is a fascinating uh, scripture because it talks about witch, uh, witchcraft and sorcery. And it says, you know, no one can participate in any of the uh, sending children through fire or um, having casting spells. Well, you know, in this country there, were, there was a time when we uh, used to burn witches at the stake uh, in our free country, amen, freedom of religion, but not freedom from witchcraft. And so if witchcraft was your religion, then we uh, took as a nation a very strong stance against that uh, to the point of killing people with some very dubious means. Largely women uh, were killed during this time. And... What's interesting about that is, at some point in time, in this country, we stopped killing witches. When was the last time you heard of a witch being burned at the stake? Anybody? Why do you suppose we stopped killing witches in this country? We don't believe it anymore. With the advent of science, I'm fairly confident that a witch could cast a spell on me And I'd be okay. Do you share that confidence? I'm pretty certain that... Now, there are are places in the world where that's not true. One of the things that has struck me um, in the United Methodist Church is the United Methodist Church is trying to reach people in three different areas. And I've I've spoken about this before. But we've tried to reach people in a pre-modern world, in the modern world, and in the post-modern world. Now, what do, those, what do those things mean? In a pre-modern world, pre-science, pre-philosophy, um, there was a lot of witchcraft and sorcery, and magic was believed to be a big part of the way the world worked. The whole Bible was written in a pre-modern worldview about how things, uh, how things work. There was a great article um, in the 1300s in England by a scientist about how to make mice. And the way you make mice is you throw some old rags and some rice in a corner. And mice appear. Magically. Now, I try to emphasize to my children the reason we don't litter the house. It seems like a perfectly good idea otherwise. But the reason we don't litter the house with wrappers and other foodstuffs is for this very reason. It attracts mice and it attracts bugs, right? But in a pre-scientific worldview, how those things happen is very different. But there are parts of the world that are still in a pre-scientific worldview. And I was talking with a group um, from, from Africa, actually, from Congo, and asking them about the things that they were worried about. And one of the things that, they, that pastors worry about is sorcery and magic and witchcraft in their communities. It's still going on. Well, I can say that may be going on in Kansas City, Kansas. I'd be surprised, but I probably wouldn't be too worried about it. 
I would just think, bless their hearts, they need, they need some help, right? They need some help. So we've really, in this country, we don't believe in sorcery and witchcraft, but one of the reasons that people didn't like Halloween is it had its origins in this kind of world. And if you still believe that that world is real, then Halloween becomes very problematic. Now, there are, there are people who use anything as an excuse to do things that are wrong. And there are certainly people who use Halloween as an excuse to do wrong, wrong things. Um, but I don't think Halloween is to, is to be blamed for that. Um, I, think people, <laughs> I think people have problems, and people exercise those in a lot of unhealthy ways, and may or may not use Halloween as a reason to do that. One of the reasons that peop there is a whole group of religious people in this country who wanted the Harry Potter books banned or burned or didn't want people reading them or going to the movies because they celebrate magic and witchcraft. They do, though I don't think even my small children think that it's true. Right? I don't think even my... I don't even think... Even though I, each of my children has a wand, they also have a lightsaber. And I've seen wand and lightsaber duels break out in my basement. But I don't get the impression, except there was one child who was really young, who thought when he did this to a door and his brother secretly hit the automatic open button, yeah, I saw that play out once and there was a little bit of time where that felt real. but. I don't worry about those things because we, it's a worldview that we don't share. Not even most of our children share it. So it's, it seems safe. Now what's interesting too is we jump to the New Testament. <clears throat> and the New Testament scripture from Luke, it's a very short scripture. But it illustrates the worldview even during Jesus' day. <clears throat> and it said in, in chapter 8, and I recognize ordinarily we would stand. It's a very short scripture. Soon afterwards, Jesus went through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve disciples were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. So in Jesus' day, and Jesus casts out a lot of demons. So it begs the question. I would say, by and large, and I'm, and you're welcome to believe what you want to believe. By and large, we don't believe in witches or sorcery or witchcraft; that it's actually real. Do we believe in demonic possession? I don't. You're welcome to. But the idea that an evil spirit would inhabit someone and cause them to do strange things, we typically have a scientific diagnosis of mental illness. There are people who hear voices. There are people who have um, difficulties. But if you look at issues like schizophrenia or bipolar or some of the other uh, mental illnesses that have uh, public manifestations sometimes, people would describe those in the olden days, if you will, as being a demon, as someone having a demon. Today, we would probably not say it was a demon, but if we do use the term demon, and I think there are demons, I typically use them, or people use them now, metaphorically, because alcoholism can be a demon, yes? Um, there can be, uh, depression can be a demon, yes? Um, there are things that can be demons, but we don't typically think that it's an outside evil spirit inhabiting someone's body Though I will tell you a story um, at, a at a Methodist church where there was a gentleman who came by and most folks who come by either want money or food. He wanted his demons cast out. And so a friend of mine was the pastor there and he talked with this man several times and realized the only thing that was going to work was to pray for this man's demons to come out. And he did. I don't know if the bishop's aware of this. I don't know if it's I don't know if, if we are authorized as United Methodist pastors to cast out demons. Now, the Catholic Church, the priests are authorized to cast out demons. I'm not sure that Methodist pastors are. I intended to look that up, but I'm pretty sure we're not. 
But anyway, he cast out the demon and he was so successful that the man would come back every week to have his demon cast out again. Now, I would say that someone in deep need of pastoral care, and my experience is there's no sense in arguing with anyone about what to believe or not to believe, right? If a prayer by the pastor is changing someone's life, we should continue to do it, should we not? So do we believe in demons? Now, here, so here are the questions. You have witchcraft and you have demons, but then you have this veil of life and death that things begin to get a little gray. Um, actually, I think Harry Potter, speaking of Harry Potter, has one of the best representations of the veil of death in the Hall of Mysteries. When he goes down and there's all the mysteries are lined up, the brain is one of them, and life and death is presented as a black veil. And you can hear voices on the other side. And the idea being when you die, you simply go to the other side of the veil. It's another part of life. Life and death are two parts of the same coin. And so, do we believe then in ghosts? Do we believe in um, spirits? Do we believe in angels? Now, I would say there's a widespread belief in this country that people believe in angels. I tend to believe in angels. Um, but what is an angel vis-a-vis -a, -vis a demon, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a ghost? So, here's the big mess, right? And this is what I love about Halloween. It takes all these things and all the spectrum and shoves them into a day, and then we typically don't think about it again. So I think it's handy for that. But one of the things that I think is real is I think the difference between life and death maybe is a thinner difference than we believe. And I have heard, as a pastor, more stories from people of faith about words and messages and conversations that they've had with loved ones who have died to a point where I don't have any reason to doubt that. I also don't have any ability to understand that in terms of scientifically understanding it or to define it. I know that's well documented in the scriptures of angels speaking um, in the scriptures, the demons talk. The demons are especially talkative to Jesus because they all know who Jesus is and not one of them likes him. But there are enough conversations that I've heard that people have shared with me that I don't have any reason to doubt that. And I'll bet most of you have either had an experience yourself or have heard someone tell you an experience yourself of an experience of someone who has died and a message that they've had back. I've heard that so many times by so many people in so many different contexts that I don't, as a, as, and people will often ask me, well, what do we believe about that? And I'll say, and this is what I believe at the end of the day, this is one of the mysteries of life and death that I don't fully understand. And I frankly don't think anyone fully understands. But I also don't think it's anything to necessarily be afraid of. I don't, I, I don't believe that there are evil spirits out there inhabiting people. Um, I don't believe that. I don't believe that there, are, um, that there are people being eternally punished to hang around earth and to haunt places. I tend to be skeptical of hauntings. Now, I have heard of people seeing and experiencing the presence of a, a ghost, and I want to tell you a story about this one of my own experiences. So, when my grandpa died, he was 90 years old, almost, yeah, he was 90 years old, and he passed away at Christmas time, and there was going to be, a, they were going to do, he was cremated, and his cremains were at the funeral, and there was going to be a later service where he was going to be interred sometime in the spring. And there was a complicated story. I don't remember why we were waiting until spring, but there was a wait that was going to happen until he was interred, which, frankly, is not, fairly, is not very uncommon. And so we had the urn, and the question was, where are we going to keep the urn? Well, my mom said, well, I prefer not to have the urn at my house. And we said, that's fine. We'll keep it at our house, right? So we kept the urn at our house. Daniel, at that time, was five years old. 
Daniel did not know. We didn't want to freak anybody out, right? So we didn't tell Daniel about this. Daniel would report almost at least every week, if not several times a week, a conversation he'd had with Grandpa. Now, he's five years old. In fact, it got to a point where he asked for a picture of Grandpa. And we, you wonder, you know, how much is a five-year-old processing? This is the first time he'd experienced and he had an experience of death. But we gave him a picture of Grandpa, and he said yes. And he kept it by his bedside. It's a picture of Grandma and Grandpa. He kept it by his bedside. And he would report these conversations with Grandpa on a regular basis. And spring came, and we had the service of interment at the, at the cemetery. And Daniel didn't hasn't reported a conversation with Grandpa since. Now, I don't know. Do you know? Are we going to tell a five-year-old that five-year-olds aren't smarter than the rest of us? Maybe he was the only one listening. That would surprise me because <laughs> my experience with five-year-olds and listening are not very good. But I can't tell you how many conversations like that I have heard from members of this church from members of other churches, from other families, from other people. And what I think it does is it challenges us to think that life and death are really two sides of the same coin. Not something to be feared. Something to be embraced. Um, we struggle with it. Everyone, I, I would that everyone would die when they're 101 years old and they're physically capable and they just don't wake up one morning. That's how we all should go. Amen. We shouldn't die sooner than that. We shouldn't die from difficult circumstances. Um, and we really struggle with death, typically, when it's too soon or someone's too close. But this in, in invitation to see life and death as two sides of the same coin is really, I think, at the heart of the Christian message of resurrection. The heart of the Christian message of resurrection. Because resurrection seems so miraculous. And I've heard people say, you know, I'm really into Jesus, but the whole resurrection thing bothers me. And that tends to come from uh, the intellectual left, that people really have a hard time with the whole resurrection piece. My suggestion is, I'm not sure it's all that far-fetched when you think about people's experiences of life and death and people's experience of life after death. That resurrection then seems to be a clear statement about what happens to us after we're gone. The, the key that I would say, too, is that whatever we say about life and death, because we cannot capture it, is at the end of the day, a metaphor, yes? Because whatever life and death is, we can only begin to capture it with our words, and our words will always fall short. So one of the things that I enjoy um, I do not like scary movies. Are there scary movie fans here? Anybody like horror movies? Any horror movie fans? They just scare me to death. I just can't do it. I'm just a big Nelly when it comes to movies, so I prefer them not scary. Isn't that sad? So I don't like scary movies, um, but I do like movies that talk about life and death in either a comical way or in a way that makes me think more about what it might mean. So I have some examples here today of, of some examples of uh, ghosts, three different concepts of ghosts, two of which will not lend you to be inclined to believe that they're true, but one that might. So I'm going to come down and I'm going to play this video for you. Stuff. Exactly. Fire and brimstone coming down from the skies. Rivers and seas boiling. Forty years of 
darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes, the dead rising from the grave, human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. When I see the Disney version of what ghosts and demons look like, that doesn't bother me. Does that bother anybody? When I see Ghostbusters, which actually I learned the hard way is totally inappropriate for small children, <laughs> but very funny. That doesn't bother me, right? Because it's absurd. The Sixth Sense, how many of you have seen The Sixth Sense? Um, if you want a movie with as interesting a final twist as any I've ever seen, I would encourage you to see The Sixth Sense. Um, and it really is a, a fascinating look at how many people understand dead people are still present somehow with us. And it's a very secular view, but it's actually a fascinating movie um, that I would, commend, I would commend to you to take a look at. Here's the dilemma on preaching about something about angels and demons and ghosts. Is the range of belief is so wide in our community, even among Christians, that it's very difficult to nail down. And I'm not inclined to say, this is what you should believe. Because my experience is I have had very poor luck talking people in and out of believing the way I do. Though I've tried, what I want to invite you to is into the conversation about thinking about what do you believe and thinking about what do you do when you hear what other people believe that you may not share. So here's what I do. People share with me things regularly that I may not believe. Does this happen to you? And so I say sometimes, okay, because maybe they have a level of understanding that I just don't have, right? Maybe they have had an experience that I haven't had, yes? Maybe they um, are aware of things that I'm not aware of. I have a friend who's a scientist, and when he talks to me about what he does at work, huh, he could be talking about witches and goblins because I don't understand it. So I want to invite us to be graceful and gracious as we hear people talk about these things, because my experience is when people talk about these things, they're very close to the heart. Yes, they're very close to the heart. And I also know that um, it's helpful to be clear about what we think. Now, I will also say what we believe often changes when we have a new experience. Yes, because we can believe a lot of things about life and death if you've never experienced death of a close loved one, then your view of death is about to change dramatically when you do. Um, I had been to three funerals in my whole life when I became a pastor. And they were all three great-grandparents of mine who died in their 90s, and funerals were about fried chicken and cousins in the basement of the church. And I can tell you, I had a very positive view of funerals. I hadn't even started at my first church. I hadn't had my first Sunday. It was the Monday before my first Sunday. And a man who was an alcoholic was drunk and fell down his own steps and died. 
and I did a funeral for a man who had demons he could not outrun. And for a family who was in terrible throes of grief, who had lost a loved one too young, too soon, too close, for reasons that could have been prevented. And my view of funerals changed when you do a funeral for based that has tragedy associated with it, and it's not just a homecoming celebration for grandma. Our view of life and death is in part shaped by our own experiences and shaped by our shared experiences. And so what I want to invite you to is one, is as you see Halloween unfold, I think it's just fun for kids. And that's why we have our kids dress up and we have a good time and they get to pick out a costume and they get a ton of candy and I get to pick from the candy bucket, which is one of the reasons I'm a big advocate of Halloween. And then we go on about our day. I also know that folks get lost in it. But I know people get lost in all kinds of things. And we need to help people who are lost in whatever they're lost in find their way back. And I do know that we all have demons that we chase and that chase us. And some days are better than others, amen? Some days we get the upper hand, some days they do. I also believe um, in the scriptures that say there's a great cloud of witnesses of our loved ones who have gone on before us, who continue to watch over us. What does that mean to watch over us? But I believe there is a great cloud of witnesses that watch over us. I also believe in the resurrection of the living God. I believe that Jesus Christ walked on this earth, was crucified, died, and rose from the dead, and sits at the right hand of the God Almighty. I believe Jesus' resurrection is not that far-fetched based on what we believe today about life and death. It is two sides of the same coin. And so for me, the uh, image of Jesus Christ as the resurrected Son of God is central and important to my faith. And I also know that there's tension in all of our traditions and in all of our beliefs about what is real and what is not real. So my invitation is an invitation to the faith in Jesus Christ, an invitation to embrace the resurrection of Christ, not only for the next life, and I think one of the greatest mistakes Christians make about the resurrection is we save all the good parts of the resurrection for when we're dead. That's too bad. Because I believe, as Jesus said, the kingdom of God is at hand and we live the resurrection each and every day in the way that we live our life. And I believe that because of the resurrection, we do have an opportunity to speak with Christ. We do have an opportunity to live with Christ right now. I also want to offer a, um, a word to um, all here and many of us here who have lost someone too soon, too young, too close. And to say that God is with that person holding that person in God's own arms. And God is also with you at the same time holding you. That God loves you and God has never left you. And that that resurrection of Jesus Christ is to help us walk through life and death. And to walk through it with grace and with compassion for others. I want to offer a word to all of us. That when you hear folks struggling with life and death, to offer a word of compassion. And my best, my best advice that I can give when someone is offering a struggle with life and death is that I know that the words are usually the first thing to fail. And if we can just sit and be present with someone, we can do more for someone than anything else. So I just want to invite us to a gracious presence with one another, to hold one another in our times of need. I do not get caught up in the particularities of theology and belief. I know that when I go into a funeral with another family, one of the things I, I ask some questions that give me an indication about how that family believes. Because I don't believe that the time of grief is the time to talk to someone about convincing someone about theology. Amen? It's a time to embrace people and to hold people and to comfort people and to walk with them on that journey. The questions about faith, the questions about belief, those will all come in time. And it's our job to simply walk with people and not to convince people. So with that, I'd offer everyone a happy Halloween. And 
we will anticipate um, All Saints Day, which is next Sunday. All Hallows' Eve is the day before All Saints Day. All Saints Day is the day we celebrate the resurrected saints. All Hallows' Eve is the day that people remember the dead. And it comes back to a theology of whether or not everyone is a resurrected saint or if some um, other dead are in hell or are still walking this earth. All Saints Day is a much uh, different celebration as we celebrate next week loved ones who have gone before us. With that, I want to close our service with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you so much for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We want to thank you for the scriptures that challenge us with a worldview that we no longer share. Scriptures about sorcery and scriptures about demons uh, that don't always make sense to us and sometimes even provide distance between us and the scriptures. But Lord, we ask that you will pour out your grace upon us. Uh, touch our hearts that this mystery of life and death will be one that we can continue to walk through with confidence and with joy and with hope. For Lord, this life is difficult. Sometimes death is difficult, but Lord, we know that you are with us always. We pray this in Jesus' name.